I wanted to launch right into the lesson, but I did want to say one thing. That is that although it has seemed like just a couple of weeks since the good elders at the Cold Harbor Road congregation uh, asked us to come and work with them, uh, they would want to get credit for every single day that I've been there. And actually, it was September 18th, 1994. And we have been working there now into our 12th year. And we enjoy the good brethren there and, and are so thankful for them and uh, the good work that uh, they were doing when we got there. And we just appreciate them. And it's like coming home when we come here. Thank you very much for the gracious way in which you open up your hearts and your lives and, and allow us to come back. And we love our hosts and we're so grateful for the opportunity that we have to rekindle that, uh, that friendship and to deepen it. And we're just so thankful for that. The first time our question had practical application was Genesis chapter 4 and verse 8. Where we read that Cain spoke with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the fields that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And later in that same chapter, Lamech confesses to having killed an unnamed man in verse 23. We have no reason to believe otherwise but that the first natural death was that of our father Adam. We read about his leaving this earth in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 3. Followed by another, we assume, natural death, that of another son, Seth, in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 8. And his son, Enosh, in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 11, and on down throughout the genealogies. In fact, as has been noted perhaps in the past, as you go down through the lives of all of the patriarchs, you see that their lives are punctuated by a profound reality that they lived so many years and they died. Around campfires and within tents and other dwellings, out under the stars and in the fields, how often did man in those early days stop and wonder within his heart or ask those that he loved or those that he met or those that he trusted, will we live again? As mothers cradled their children or as children cared for their dying parents, surely they wondered. And as they attended the funerals of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their spouses, was it a topic of conversation at the funeral or thereafter? As they lost loved ones tragically or as they saw them waste away from disease, was it in their heart? Most experts would date the events of the book of Job to that starlight era of Revelation, the patriarchal age. And surely men were still wrestling with that question, that great matter, when Job, buckled by severe trials, was responding to Zophar the Naamathite. And he said, But man dieth and wasteth away. Yea, man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? As the waters fail from the sea and the floods decayeth and dryeth up, so man lieth down and riseth not. Till the heavens be no more, they shall not awake, neither be raised out of their sleep. Oh, that I would, uh, he would hide me in the grave. Oh, that he would keep me secret till his wrath be past. He would set me upon a time and remember me. If a man die, shall he live again? All the appointed time of my days will I wait till my change come. Job chapter 14, verse 10 through 14. Now, if you were to come across just a part of that verse, that is the part that makes up the caption of our lesson tonight, Job chapter 14, verse 14a, as we might say. And you see that phrase, if a man dies, shall he live again? And he came across that. You might think that Job, in the midst of his great suffering, was asking a question about 
something beyond this life, reaching out beyond the grave and wondering, will I continue to exist? Will I be resurrected someday? That might be a reasonable conclusion. But if you keep that verse in its context and read what uh, Job is saying in reply, what he is saying is, I have a dilemma in this earthly situation that I cannot figure out, and I'm looking for vindication. You see, Job and certainly the friends we know, and maybe the whole community had this idea that if you were doing well, it must mean that you're righteous. But if you are suffering, it is because either visibly, or if it's a more egregious thing and secret thing, nevertheless, some sin in your life is causing you to suffer. All these things stripped away because you have done something wrong. But Job maintained his integrity. He had done nothing wrong. And so what he wanted was an appearance in the courtroom of God. He wanted God to come and to vindicate him before all. Unlike the New Age thinkers and the Buddhists and the other believers in reincarnation, he realized that man gets one shot at it in this life. And there is no reappearance in any number of times in whatever form. If he was going to be seen in the eyes of others as being the righteous person that he was, it had to be in this life. Or there would not be another. And so he said, if a man dies, shall he live again? No, this is my only shot. And while Job may not have been groping for an understanding about something beyond the grave, are we not in agreement that many throughout the ages have taken up this very question and have applied it spiritually? That is, when this body dies and they lay it in the grave, Am I going to continue to be conscious? Am I going to retain my identity? Am I going to continue to live on and on and on? You know, as we begin to study and look for an answer, we need to understand that Job does not get an answer to that question from God in the book of Job. For it is not the purpose of God in the book of Job to let Job understand all the whys or wherefores. The bottom line of the book of Job is that God is to be served, God is to be honored, worshipped, pleased, and adored, not because of what he does for us, but because of who he is. Job settled with that understanding, resigned to that, and in full submission serves and praises his God. But what about our question? Will we live after death? Well, let's go searching for an answer, and as we look throughout the Old Testament, we see whispers of a reply you might think of Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2 or the psalmist in Psalm chapter 16 and verse 10. But then you get to the New Testament and there's sporadic affirmation both in the Gospels and in the book of Acts, in the epistles and also in the book of Revelation. And while we have no idea how fully developed the idea of the patriarchs or those under the Mosaical dispensation was with regard to the resurrection, God answers the question in the Bible. And when God answers a question, it's power packed. But if it be preached that Christ rose from the dead, how say there some of you that there be no resurrection of the dead? If there be no resurrection of the dead, then it's not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, then our preaching is vain. Yea, hey, your faith also is vain. For if so be that the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised? And we are found false witnesses of God, for we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not, the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, then your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Those also who are, have uh, uh, fallen asleep in Jesus are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. For as in man came death, so by man came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Every man in his own order, for Christ the first fruits, then they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when Christ will have delivered up the kingdom unto God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12 through verse 26. The entire chapter, chapter of 1 Corinthians 15 answers the question, will we live again emphatically in the positive? 
As you read throughout there, you see that wherever you are, and you will be somewhere for all of eternity, is tied to what Jesus did in the cross and what God did in the tomb. Oh, I wish that we had the time tonight to do a thorough exposition of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where we get a resounding yes to the answer, of, uh, an answer to the question, will we live again? But if you'll note just a very brief five-point overview of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that first of all, we will live again. And this is proven by a great many different things. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 33. We will live again as proven by a great many different things. But then second, we will live again, though it be very difficult for us to grasp. 1 Corinthians 15, 34 through 49, which I believe constitutes one of the more difficult sections, certainly of the epistles, maybe of the whole Bible. Talking about the new body and the transformation that's going to be taking place and the way that it is sown and the way that it is raised and all the particulars. But then third, we will rise again in a changed and spiritual condition. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50 and 51. Fourth, we will rise again. We will live again. And we will rise and go into judgment and live somewhere for all of eternity. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 through 57. And fifth, we will live again, and thus we should live right in this life. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. Paul nowhere teaches soul sleeping in this chapter. But the idea is that all of us who come into life are going to continue to live consciously somewhere for all of eternity. And as we view and understand that reality, then we are going to live right in view of, of that time and that day. We who are physically alive and who someday will die are going to continue to live on, though unseen and unheard by those in this material realm. In all of those verses, I would like for us in the time that we have to answer Job's question from that beautiful section that we're studying of poetry this year. God not answering directly Job's question or the question that we form from Job's words in Job 14 and verse 14. But Paul in that same book of Revelation giving us the answer. What I want us to do is see five beautiful implications for those of us who are Christians because we will live again. I want you to notice five wonderful things because we'll live again. Number one, because we will live again, preaching has meaning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 14. It's very interesting to me that Paul's device that he uses here in 1 Corinthians 15, 14 through 18 is to state his positive and the negative. He gives all of these negative statements, but they combine together for the positive idea that we are going to live again. We're going to live after death. Why are you listening to this sermon tonight? If this life is all that there is. You see the foundation of all gospel preaching. Is the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 1 through 8. The sum and substance of it all. From the very beginning. For you see God has chosen preaching from the dawn of time. To save all those that will believe. To show his will and his word to man. 2 Peter 2 verse 5 tells us that even Noah was a preacher of righteousness. At the very beginning. Well, someone says, well, Neil, the reason why we have preaching is to pump us up and to motivate us to live better. Okay, granted, but why? In view of what? If our only hope and if our only incentive is in this life, we are of all people most to be pitied. No, there's something much far and greater than that, some deeper meaning to the preaching that we do. Not one threat, not one promise has any threat or any hope without the power of the resurrection. Why does gospel preaching stir the hearts of the honest or prick the conscience of the sensitive? It is because of the power and the meaning of the resurrection. After certain days, Felix with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, came and, uh, called, and uh, Felix called for Paul and heard him preach concerning the faith in Christ. And as Paul reasoned of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come, Felix trembled and said, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Acts 24, 23, and 24. He was disturbed because of the power and meaning of the message because of the implication of the resurrection. Earlier in this same letter, 
Paul in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 4 and 5 said, that my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, no, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 4 and 5. You see, gospel preaching points to the power of God, including God's power to raise up Christ and the power that He will one day demonstrate in rise, raising all from the grave. Because we will live again, gospel preaching has meaning. But then second, because we will live again, faith has meaning. It's the Hebrews writer that gives us that well-known definition of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. And you'll recall that on one hand, faith involves hope and things unseen. In other words, accepting things based on trust. But on the other hand, faith involves substance and evidence or accepting things based on tangibles. And one of those tangibles is the weight of evidence in the favor of the resurrection of Christ. What do you do with hundreds of witnesses from different walks of life, with different educational backgrounds, on separate occasions, who saw the risen Christ. What do you do with the enemies of Christ, both Jew and, and Gentile, who heard the early preaching of the apostles and the other early Christians, who claimed that Jesus was no longer in the grave, but that he was alive? Why did they not present the evidence if it was there? And then there's the question of where the body is. Oh, the disciples had it. Well, why did those who claim to be eyewitnesses of the resurrection not recant their hoax, if that were the case, even at the cost of their very lives? Our faith rests not only on hope and unseen things, but our faith in the resurrection and the fact that we will live again is on evidence and on substance. Dear Christians, when you begin to question the meaning and purpose of your life, if you want to get back on track, all you have to do is glance at the empty tomb. When you begin to wrestle with questions of fairness and equity, being cross-eyed gives you proper focus. And being grave-minded gives you joy because Jesus is no longer in His. According to the Apostle Paul, Christians, you have two choices. Either your faith is vain or your faith can be victorious. Kathy and I next month will be making our fourth trip to uh, Africa, East Africa. And one of the many graceful creatures that are uh, over there is the impala. The impala is a beautiful creature, but to see it run and jump, it will, run, it will jump higher than 10 feet at times and over distances spanning more than 30 feet. It's amazing. But you know, you can take an impala and put it inside of most zoo enclosures. You can keep it behind a retaining wall, I understand, as low as three feet tall. But an impala won't jump to a place where it cannot see its feet land. So it won't jump over those walls. I'm not saying that faith is a blind leap. It's so much more than that as we've already seen. You see, it's because of what we have trust and confidence in, and even more as we'll see in just a moment. This abiding hope and trust that what God has said in His Word is true and how it's been proven time and time again. And yet we must confess that we are going to a place that we have never seen to see one who died for us whom we will look upon for the first time when he stand, or we stand before Him as He is our judge. And yet that faith and trust upholds us and bolsters us throughout life come what may. Because we will live again According to verse 14 and 17, faith has meaning. But then third, because we will live again, the apostles are trustworthy witnesses. Verse 15, Paul reminds us that their reputation and their credibility is tied to the reality of the resurrection. Paul preaching on another occasion in Acts chapter 13, talking about Jesus Christ in verse 27, says that because uh, the people nor the rulers knew not Jesus nor the prophets that are read every Sabbath day have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though there was no cause of death in him, yet they desired Pilate that he should be slain. And when all they fulfilled all things concerning him, they took him down from the tree and they laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen by those who had come up from Galilee, Jerusalem with him. And they are his witnesses unto the people. Acts 13, 27 through 31. Earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul recounts the many people who saw Jesus, the living Christ. 
And if you go back to the gospel records, you will see the many instances of the apostles and the other uh, early disciples who saw the empty tomb and the living Lord. And because of the trust that this builds, we can trust implicitly their inspired accounts. We can trust John's record, who records the words of Jesus. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good under the resurrection of life, they that have done evil under the resurrection of condemnation. Then there's Peter's extensive writing on the matter, 2 Peter 3, 1 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, but also Peter, who was allowed by the Lord to be the first preacher of the gospel as the church age is ushered in. And as Peter stands before his audience on the day of Pentecost, the very first sermon that he preached, the very first point of the first sermon, as he introduces the first point, you remember? Jesus Christ, a man of God, approved of God, among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in your presence, as you yourselves also know. According to the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you took and with wicked hands did crucify and slay. But God raised him from the dead. That was the gospel message from the very beginning. Acts 2, 22 through 24. And then there's Paul and his extensive writings and his preaching. Remember how he ended that great sermon on Mars Hill in Acts 17? And the time of this ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard him speak of the resurrection of the dead, you see, Christ's resurrection, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, is tied to the general resurrection. Some mocked, and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. I don't think this is circular reasoning. But as we begin to read the Bible, we know that we will live again because the apostles and the other inspired writers are reasonable witnesses. And because they are reasonable witnesses, it bolsters our faith in the idea that we will live again. Because we will live again, the apostles and the inspired writers are trustworthy witnesses. And fourth, because we will live again, we can overcome the sting of sin. That's verse 17. You know, France and England were at war at the beginning of the 1800s. And at the Battle of, battle of Waterloo, the Brits were awaiting the outcome of that battle. And uh, they only had one way to communicate, and that was by a, a series of signal lights across the English Channel. And so the battle had been over, and so they were trying to get that message across. But a fog rolled in just about the time that the message was being flashed. And in fact, only two words were visible. Wellington defeated and the Brits were filled with terror because they thought Napoleon was surely going to take over the world. Can you imagine their joy when the fog lifted and they saw the entire message? Wellington defeated the enemy. Without the resurrection, there's nothing but a fog of hopelessness. For there is no possibility of forgiveness. We are all too aware of the sin problem that all of us have Later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says, O grave, where is thy sting? O death, where is thy victory? The, the, strength of, I mean, the, uh, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God, who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus took the stinger out of sin. You all know the story about the family who's driving down the road, and the windows are down. And as they are riding along, a black bee darts into that uh, car. And begins to fly around, and the little girl in the back seat is deathly allergic to that bee, and so she begins to frantically cry out to her dad, Daddy, get that bee, it's going to sting me. So dad pulls over the car, and he reaches back and fumbles around until he gets that bee, and he holds it in his hand, and he lets the bee sting him. And he lets it go. The little girl starts to get a little frantic again, but the dad quickly explained to her, Honey, don't worry, that bee can't hurt you. The stinger's right here. Thomas missed the first meeting. Eight days later, Jesus comes. The door's being shut, and he's in the midst of them again. And uh, he says, Peace be to you. And he turns to Thomas, and he says, Thomas, reach hither thy finger, and behold my hand. Reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said, My Lord and my God. 
John chapter 20, verse 26 through 28. We have confidence as we walk in the light that if death comes, it's okay because we've died to sin, Romans 6 and verse 2. And we're alive again to righteousness, Romans 6, 3 and 4, through baptism into Christ based on our faith and repentance. And so, Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. As it is appointed to men once to die, and after this, the judgment. Christ is going to appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Because we will live again, we can overcome the sting of sin. We have all sinned, but Christ has given the remedy. And at the resurrection, we will join with Christ in the victory if we're faithful. But because we will live again, we will see those faithful Christians who have died already. Verse 18. On October 25th of last year, Kathy, the boys, and I finished a trip we began in Mechanicsville the day before. Ended in Northport, Alabama. I believe it was 2 o'clock that afternoon, I think a Tuesday afternoon. We assembled for the funeral of Brother Wendell Winkler. I know in what high regard he is held by those here. I know he was formerly a preacher here. I know a lot of preachers could say what I'm going to say, but he was probably the greatest influence on my life and work as a preacher, as an adult, of anyone else. As we assembled there, the singing was beautiful. The prayers were uplifting. The preaching was inspiring. As Tim and then Mike and finally Dan preached lessons, much of which was based on material that came from Brother Winkler's life and work. I can't help but thinking that all those who were present had another reason to want to go to heaven to see and visit Brother Winkler again. Man, I made a big mistake one time in the pulpit. I got up and said that May 14th was the second most important day in my life. I said the first, of course, was the day of my baptism in April 1979. I said, but May 14th, and I was trying to say it was my anniversary, but I found out later that it was Kathy's birthday. <laughs> what would you do to get out of that? Well, I'm not usually the swiftest of thinkers, but I said, well, if she hadn't been born, we couldn't have gotten married. <laughs> May 14th is a special day at our house. May 14th is not taken on a sad ring at all, no, but it has another mark. You see, May 14th, 2004, was the day of my grandfather's funeral. And I was asked to preach that funeral. What an honor that was. And as I stood and looked out over those who were assembled in the chapel that day, most of whom were Christians, most on my mom's side are members of the body of Christ, faithful, uh, a good many of them, and those other church members. I even looked out and saw my grandfather's brother, who though not a twin, looked very much like him. It was as if I was preaching to my grandfather. I talked about his godly influence as an elder and his influence on the family. I also realized that I'll never visit him again in this life. I have confidence that I will see him again. You know, uh, a man by the name of Farrer wrote a book called Point Man. Not a member of the church, but a good book for men to read. Some years ago, I realized that I'm the point man in my family. I want desperately, perhaps even more than my own salvation, to be able to see my wife and children up there. We have the confidence that someday we'll be able to stand together on that heavenly shore and spend a timeless moment together and to bash together in the light of the sun. Our confidence is that all those who have lived and died faithfully are going to assemble again together there in heaven. I know as I speak here tonight that there are some of you who have said goodbye to dear loved ones. You've said goodbye to godly parents. Maybe even say for children who died in a saved condition. Maybe you lost your helpmate in life. You'll never be able to commune with them at the table of this life. And you've shared so much of life together, you've laughed together, and you've cried together. But you can have confidence that if you're faithful, you will see each other again. 
But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others that have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so those that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall in no way prevent or precede those who are asleep. For Jesus, the Lord himself, shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive, that is, if that is the case for us when the Lord comes again, we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Because we will live again. Maybe Paul wraps this all together very well in two verses that are polar opposites of one another. Right in the middle of that discussion. And I want you to notice how dramatic the contrast is. First in verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ Jesus, we are of all men most miserable. Suppose that Revelation had closed it, put a period right there, and that's all. Friends, I would suggest if so, let's close the service. Let's never have another lectureship. Let's never meet together for worship because there's no hope. It's all over. But now is Christ risen from the dead. Become the first fruits of them that sleep. Because we will live again. Jesus came out of that grave. And if death takes us before he comes again, we're going to come out of the grave. And so the question of eternal consequences becomes, how will we be living when we physically die? If his coming precedes our death, how will we be living when all death dies? We're going to live on. That will either be a thought of great rejoicing and comfort, and it should be. But for those who have never obeyed the gospel and for those who aren't living faithfully, it should fill one with utter terror. Wayne Jackson writes, How thrilled Job would have been if he had been privileged to hear the words of the Lord Jesus, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Job didn't hear those words. But we have. Because we will live again, gospel preaching has meaning. Faith has meaning. The apostles are trustworthy witnesses. We can overcome the sting of sin. We will see again those faithful Christians who have died already. It is a sweet and glorious thought that comes to me. Jesus saved my soul from death and now I'm free. Sweeter words to us there should never be. I'll live on. Thank you.